Cold season can really slow you down. Zycam Cold Remedy is clinically proven to shorten colds when taken at the first sign, while other cold medicines simply mask symptoms. Find Zycam's homeopathic products from rapid melts to nasal swabs at all major retailers, including Walmart. Zycam products are safe and effective. Visit Zycam.com slash garage to receive a $2 coupon on your next Zycam purchase. Welcome to Shaker Heights, Episode 1, A Scream in the Night. On the east side of Cleveland, there's a quaint little town called Shaker Heights. It's a planned community, originally designed by the Van Swearingen brothers, two eccentric railroad tycoons over a hundred years ago. They built grand mansions and gardens, and in the middle of the town is a roundabout with a classic movie theater and coffee shop. Today, Shaker Heights is an odd mix of upper-class blue bloods and severely poor multi-generational families of immigrants who live on the edge of town where the big city encroaches. Nowhere else in greater Cleveland is the racial and economic disparity of the region so apparent. Shaker Heights is the best and worst of everything we have to offer. But in its heart, Shaker Heights is still a small town. It's a small town with a small police department used to small town problems. And on September 14th, 1990, the murder of a young woman tore this town apart. This podcast revisits the murder of 16-year-old Lisa Pruitt, who was stabbed 21 times and left for dead behind a mansion at the corner of Lee and South Woodland. We present to you the mystery as it transpired from the point of view of the detectives who worked the case. Each episode presents reenactments of conversations between witnesses and detectives that have been taken verbatim from official court documents. A classmate of Lisa's, a young man named Kevin Young, was ultimately charged with her murder, but was acquitted by a jury of his peers. You will meet Kevin and other suspects along the way as the police build their case against him, and at some point, you will have to decide for yourself, did Kevin Young get away with murder, or did a group of high school teens influence the investigation? in order to protect one of their own. The mystery begins just hours after the murder, as police sit down with Lisa's boyfriend, Dan Dryford, for his first formal interview. This is Detective Richard Mullaney of the Shaker Heights Police Department conducting an interview with one Daniel R. Dryford at the Shaker Heights Police Department. Statement followed by interview. Daniel, statement, please. I was discharged from the Cleveland Clinic at maybe 2 p.m. Or either that or I left the compound at 2 p.m. And it, that was the 13th of September. I went home, put my stuff away, and rode my bike to school. That's where I saw Lisa. I surprised her. She didn't know I was being discharged that day. I walked around the school with her and walked her to her mom's car. Her her mom was waiting for her. It must have been about 3.20 p.m. Then I hung out with some friends until about 5.30 p.m., came home and ate dinner. My parents went out and my next-door neighbor cut my hair. That's about when Kenny Workman came over. I don't know what time at exactly, but it was around 8 p.m. And then my parents came home. We spent some time with them and 
Then Lisa stopped by after her flute lesson at about 9 p.m. with her father. He was waiting in the driveway. She stayed for about five minutes and she expressed to me then something about that this was the best day in her life because I got out of the hospital and she got her driver's license and everything was just going right. Then she said or asked if it was okay if she stopped by later. I don't think she gave me a time. And then I was with Ken till probably 10 p.m. He left and then I went inside and talked to my mom for a while. Then Lisa called sometime between 10 after 9 and 10 after 10 and, and said that if, if she came over, it would be between 1230 and 1 a.m., the 14th of September, and that she would just throw a rock on my window or something like that. At about 11 p.m., I watched the news and then went to my room at exactly 11.32 p.m. I listened to some music and put away some more stuff from the hospital. My sister called at midnight. And I talked to her till 12.30 said goodnight to my parents, went to my room, and that's when I heard screaming coming from outside near the corner of Lee and South Woodland. My father said that he looked at the clock and it was around 12.30 and we were concerned about the noise. He noticed that I had shoes on. He asked me to go check it out. So I went out to the front edge of the property and I saw nothing, and heard nothing. So I went back inside and suggested my father call the police, but we both agreed that there was nobody out there, so not really nothing we could do. Then I went up to my room, put some more stuff away, I think, and that's when I remembered that Lisa said she might come over. I don't exactly know why or when, but it was at that point that I suspected it could have been her that was screaming, so I went back outside. It must have been 12.45 a.m. maybe, and I waited there for a little bit, I think, and then I was going to like walk to where I might see her coming. First, I went to the edge of the property. Then I went a little further and I saw, I saw her bike in the bushes. I touched it just to pull it out and make sure it was hers. And when I saw that it was, I, I ran back to my house and called Lisa's house. Nobody answered. I got the answering machine, but I didn't leave a message. And then I called 911 and told them that my girlfriend's bike was in the bushes and I had heard someone screaming earlier. And so they said they'd send a car over. I waited in my driveway in the apron and I led the police officer to where the bike was. I told him the bike's over here and I, I assume he knew what had happened. He asked if I had touched it and I told him, yeah. I asked him if I could tell my parents what was happening and he said that was probably a good idea. So I, I went in, I woke my father up and told him that I thought the screaming had been Lisa and that her bike was in the bushes. Then there was, I don't know, a bunch of stuff waiting around. He talked to a police officer and eventually I went to sleep. It must have been around 2.30 in the morning. Not long after that, it seems, my parents woke me up and told me that I had to come here to make this statement. So that's it. Before giving this statement, were you advised of your constitutional rights and did you fully understand them? Yeah. Have you been promised anything or threatened in any way to make this statement? No, I haven't. Are you presently under the influence of any alcohol or drugs? No. In your statement, you refer to Lisa. Will you give me her full name and spell it? Yeah, it's Lisa Lee Pruitt. L-I-S-A-L-E-E-P-R-U-E-T-T. -E -E -T. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, were Lisa's parents aware of the fact that Lisa was coming to visit you? No, they weren't. To the best of your knowledge, were your parents aware Lisa was coming to visit you? No, they, they weren't. In your statement, you refer to your next door neighbor cutting your hair. Would you please give me her full name and spell it? Yeah, it was, it was Kimberly Lampson Rathbone. Can you describe the clothing you were wearing at the time the police arrived at your house? Huh, I was wearing brown moccasins, a black bathing suit with flowers on it, and a t-shirt from a... Unitarian Youth Conference in Toledo. Showing you a white t-shirt, brand name Fruit of the Loom, size large, 42 to 44, with the insignia on the front in purple and black, letter stating Spring Conference 1988 Toledo, Maumee Valley, and also containing the words The Search for Self and the initials why are you you on the front? Is this the shirt that you're describing above that you're wearing? Yeah, that's it. 
were you wearing these clothes all day? And if not, will you describe when you change clothing and put on other clothes? I might have changed into the T-shirt when I was discharged from the hospital, but I'm not sure. I, I might have also put it on when I got up. I, I did take the T-shirt off when I was having my hair cut and put it back on afterwards. I, I think I took it off when I went to sleep at about 2.30 on the 14th, and I put on a blue button-up when the police arrived, because I, basically because I couldn't find the white T-shirt, which was sitting near the clothes chute. I was wearing a different pair of shoes, and I was wearing the moccasins up until the discharge, and then I switched into a pair of Converse All-Stars until probably 12.30. I had taken the shoes off at some time during the night and put my moccasins on to go check the screaming outside. Could you describe the Converse All-Star shoes you were wearing? Yeah, they were size 9 Chuck Taylors, tie-dyed in many different colors, and they're, they're high tops. Could you describe what you remember of the screams? That you heard? It sounded like someone, a female, was being forced to do something they didn't want to do. It lasted for at least 15 seconds, but I can't say for sure. Uh, when you heard the screams, where were you in the house? I was in my room, which is facing Lee Road. Uh, it's on the second floor. Is your room uh, on the north side or the south side of the house? It'd be on the north side. When you heard the screams, what exactly were you doing? I was in, in just the listening to a tape and putting some things away. I had a lot of bags of stuff from the hospital, so I was just basically tidying up my room. What tape was it you were listening to? It was uh, REM's album Document. It was a, a live version recorded in Holland on October 12th, 87. While you are listening to the tape, were you wearing headphones? No, I wasn't. When you heard the scream... Was your window open or shut? It was shut. Was there a storm window on the outside of your window? Uh, and do you know if it was down? No, not a storm window. But there was a screen, a pane of glass, and in a shade half pulled down, with curtains over that that were half closed. Normally, it would have all been shut, but I'd opened it on the day before I'd left for the hospital. Was the door to your room leading to the hallway open or shut? My door was open, and a door leading to my parents' hallway was slightly open, and my parents' door would have been slightly open. Is there a bathroom between your room and your parents' room? Yeah, but it, it's blocked off by a wall unit in my room and locked on their side. So that I understand you correctly, you cannot see from your room into the bathroom or into your parents' room? No, I can't see anything, not, not even the door. After you heard the scream, what action did you take? Huh, I, I went to my window, pulled up the shade, and looked out. And that was when I heard my father say, Did you hear that? And I said, Yeah. Did you open the window? Oh, yeah, I opened the window. and I closed it a couple minutes later, though. Uh, after opening the window, what did you hear outside? Well, the screaming still continued. So that I understand you correctly, you heard the scream... Your father yelled to you something to the effect, did you hear that? You opened the window, and then you heard the screaming continue. Yeah. Was there any pause in the screaming, or was it continuous? No, it, it was, it was a, a bunch of short screams. You stated previously that the scream sounded like it came from a female, is that correct? Yeah. In your opinion, was this scream from an older or younger female? I, I can't tell. I, I don't know. Did you hear any words crying out, or was this just a scream? No, j no words, just, just a scream. After the screaming stopped, what, what action did you take? Well, while the screaming was still going on, I went downstairs and out the front door to see what I could see. How far out the front door did you go? Uh, out the door to the sidewalk, right to the edge of our property. When you walked out the front door, what route did you take to reach the sidewalk? There's a sidewalk leading from our door right to the edge of our property. It's it's like a turnaround type sidewalk. It has two entrances to it. Did you walk out onto the city sidewalk, which runs parallel to the Lee Road? At that time, I only stopped on one block or section of city sidewalk. When you reached the front door, as you're walking out into the yard, could you still hear the screaming? 
No, it was it stopped by then. From the time the screaming stopped to the time you reached the sidewalk on Lee Road, in your opinion, approximately how much time passed? From 30 seconds to two minutes, maybe. When you reached the sidewalk, what did you observe? I didn't see or hear anything out of the ordinary. Was there any traffic on Lee Road at this time? I don't think so. So that I understand you correctly, you didn't see any traffic either north or southbound on Lee Road or anything east or westbound on South Woodland. I only looked south on Lee Road and, and didn't notice traffic. And I don't remember looking at South Woodland, not that I recall. There was nobody walking on the sidewalks? No, nobody. Was your father with you at this time? And if not, where was he? My father was at the door. At this time when you were on the sidewalk, were you wearing the clothes you described? Yes. How long did you remain on the sidewalk, and, and what did you do next? I stayed for about 10 seconds. Then I walked back to the house, told my father that I didn't see anything. He and I went up to his room where, I don't know, I, I think that's where I suggested calling the police. Uh, after you heard the scream, did you leave your room and go directly downstairs and outside? Yeah, after I looked out the window and answered my father. Did you see your father in the hallway on your way down? Yeah, I did. Did you have any conversation with him at that point? Yeah, he said, oh good, you're dressed. Will you go check and see what's happening? After you went back in your father's room, you state that you suggested that the police be called. Did either you or your father contact the police at this time? No. Um, although my dad had his hand on his phone as if he was going to contact them, but then we decided that there was nothing we could do. It had been almost three or four minutes since the screaming. Was your mother awake at this time? As she woke up during the screams. Did you have any conversation with your mother at, at this time while you're talking in the room with your father? I don't recall. What did you do then? Well, went to my room and cleaned it some more, I guess. You stated you went outside a second time, is that correct? Yeah, it is. How long was that after you returned to your room? Maybe 15 minutes, maybe a bit less. Did, did you advise either your father or your mother that you're going back outside? No. To your knowledge, were they awake at this time? Uh, I'm not sure, and I didn't check. So I understand you correctly. You went back outside the second time because at the time you realized that Lisa Pruitt might be coming over to see you. Is that correct? Yeah. At that point, did you think that the screams that you heard might possibly have been from Lisa Pruitt? No, I didn't think that for a couple of minutes, but... Then I thought it might have been her. And when you went outside the second time, what were your exact route to, of travel? And what actions did you take? And also, what did you discover, if anything? I walked down our sidewalk to the edge of the property, continued down towards South Woodland on the city sidewalk, and then I saw Lisa's bicycle. And then I ran home, called her house, got the answer machine, didn't leave a message, and called 911. Why did you call Lisa's house? I was hoping that maybe it wasn't her bicycle and that she'd been home, and I felt that if it was her bicycle, her parents should know. Describe the bicycle you saw when you walked down the sidewalk in the exact location in relation to the sidewalk in your residence. The bike was approximately 30 feet from my house in the bushes on the right-hand side of the sidewalk, and it was a purple girl's Miata. When you say 30 feet from your house, was that 30 feet south of your property line? Yeah. How far in the bushes was this bike located? Not very far. The bushes are only about four feet thick until you get into the yard. It was not hanging over onto the sidewalk, and it, I don't know how far into the bushes, it, but it was, it was within reach. Was the frame of the bike parallel or perpendicular to the sidewalk? It was parallel. Did you ever see this bike before? Oh, yeah. It's it's Lisa's bike. So you knew when you saw the bike right away uh, that this was Lisa Pruitt's bike? No. I thought it was, but, like, I wasn't sure. 
after you found the bike, did you physically touch it at all? Yeah, I, I, I grabbed it just so I could get a closer look at it. Then what did you do? I, I stuffed it back in the bushes and ran to my house. When you grabbed the bike to look at it, did you pull it out of the bushes? I, I don't recall if the bike ever left the bushes, but it was in it was in arm's reach, so I might have lifted it out of the bushes, but I, I can't say for sure. After you examined the bike, did you just let it drop, or was it being supported by the bushes? The bushes were so thin that it was it was being like slightly supported, so it, it did fall a little bit. So at that point, you had an idea that this bike might be Lisa's? Is that After correct? looking at it, yeah. Did you call out for Lisa, or did you do anything further checking, um, do any further checking of the area to see if you might possibly locate her? No. Was there anyone you observed walking in the area this time? Nobody. What are your thoughts at this time? I was... I guess scared that something had happened to Lisa. So that's why I ran to the house and tried to call her on the phone. When you called Lisa's number, which is what? It was 283-7373. The answering machine was on at that number. Is that correct? Yeah. Did you listen to the whole message? No. I, once it started, I hung up. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, what did the portion of the message you listened to state? No, it was, it was something like you've reached or sorry we're not home, but I, I could tell it was her mother's voice. Immediately after you hung up, you called 911. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. At that point, you made your mother or father aware of your fears? No. Why not? Uh, I was too busy calling and running around. I wasn't I wasn't thinking straight. It was just like a rush. After you called the police, what did you do? I ran to the apron and waited for them to, to arrive. Before the police arrived, did you go back to where the bike was? Uh, did you check the area at all or call out in an effort to locate Lisa? No. Have you ever had sexual intercourse with Lisa Pruitt? Yeah. When was the last time? Uh, two months ago. When you last saw Lisa Pruitt on the evening of September 13th, 1990, what was she wearing? I only remember that she had a pair of faded jeans. When was the last time you saw Lisa Pruitt? Uh, just after nine on September 13th in my driveway when she got into her dad's car. Do you remember anything else about her clothing the last time you saw her, such as the top she was wearing or her shoes? No, I remember her hair was down and she always wears a white ring on her finger and a chain around her neck that has a metal nut on it like this. Are you right or left-handed? I'm right-handed. To your knowledge, did Lisa Pruitt date, have sexual relations with anyone else during the time that you had a relationship with her? No. At any time since you have known Lisa Pruitt, did you strike her physically? Never. After you went to the sidewalk to wait for the police, how long was it before they arrived? Must have been four minutes. During those four minutes, did you leave the area where you were standing for any reason? No, I just stood in one spot until the car arrived. What did you tell the first officer who arrived at your house? Well, I just I told him where the bike was, and he didn't ask many, if any, questions. He wasn't very responsive. After you told him where the bike was, what did he do? He looked around the bushes and then walked back to the sidewalk in front of my house and told me to go inside and that someone would be coming in to talk to me. Also, he said it would be a good idea for me to wake my parents. Could you describe what you did next? Um, I ran into the house via the front lawn, went to the back door, went up the stairs, woke my father, and told him that the screaming had been Lisa and that her bike was in the bushes and that there were police outside. After explaining this to your father, what, what did you do next? I, I took him outside through the front door because... 
I believe he wanted to talk to the police officer, but they weren't in sight. I, I think I showed him where the bike was then. At some point, did you again talk to the police officers at your house? Yeah, about a half hour later. I don't recall anything about the conversation except that I noticed the police officer was smoking. Could you describe any physical contact you had with Lisa since your release from the hospital? Well, I I hugged her and kissed her when I got to school. I hugged her and walked her to her mom's car at school. She touched my hair after I had it cut. And while at my house, I hugged her and kissed her as she was leaving. To the best of your recollection, how many times in the past has Lisa come over to your house late at night? Twice, maybe once. Can you describe when this was and, and how she got this, to your house? This would have been four months ago, and she got there on her bike. To the best of your knowledge, did did either her parents or your parents know about her visit four months ago? No, they don't. Have you ever known Lisa to carry anything for self-defense? No. Do you believe that she had any fear of being out on the streets late at night? I I wouldn't know. Have you and Lisa had any disagreements or arguments lately? Well, we only ever had one disagreement, and, and that was in mid-July. Do you have any further knowledge of what happened to Lisa in the early morning hours of September 14th, 1990? Well, well, yeah. One of the officers told me that someone living between South Woodland and Parkland had reported screams. At what time did you become aware of the fact that Lisa was no longer alive? Well, at 4 a.m. When, when I was informed that I was a suspect for aggravated murder. Just to back up for a minute, what time did you first hear the scream, approximately? About 12.30 a.m. What time did you go back outside, approximately, when you discovered the bike? I saw a clock at 11.32, and then again in the early morning hours. But all the rest, it's just estimates. Uh, approximately how much time passed between the time... When you returned to the house after checking the house the first time and you went out the second time and discovered the bike? Maybe 15 minutes. I'm not sure, but it might have been 5 or 20. At what point during the evening do you recall that you changed from um, Converse tennis shoes to moccasins? I, I took the, the Converse off sometime after 10 and switched into the moccasins probably 12.30. What do you normally wear to bed? Sometimes underwear. Sometimes underwear and shorts. Sometimes underwear, shorts, and a t-shirt. And sometimes underwear and a t-shirt. If you had gone to school today, what time would you have gotten up? 7 a.m. On a school night, what time do you normally go to bed? I couldn't really say because I haven't been to school in four months, but... I have to be in my room by 11.30. Do you, ever, do you ever carry any type of weapon? No. After the police arrived at your house and you went back into the house, were your parents up at that time? No, they weren't awake. When you woke your father up, what did he tell you? What did you tell him? I just told him that the police were outside, that the screaming had been Lisa, and that her bike was in the bushes, and he asked some questions. And it came up that Lisa had mentioned she wanted to come over. At that point, how, how did you know that the screaming you had heard had come from Lisa? I was only 99% sure, and I deduced that because I thought it was her bike and she wasn't home. Did you tell your father what you thought had happened to Lisa? I don't recall that I ever did. How much time passed in your estimation between the time you woke your father to tell him and the time that myself and other officers came into your bedroom? An hour and a half, two hours. Uh, do you know of anyone who had or might have had a serious disagreement with Lisa Pruitt, which might have caused him to harm her? No. Would you be willing, with your parents' consent, to submit to a polygraph examination in reference uh, to the murder of Lisa Pruitt? 
Yeah, I would. Did you kill Lisa Pruitt? No, I didn't. Do you know who killed Lisa Pruitt? I don't. Who else besides you and Lisa Pruitt knew that she was coming over to your house after 1230 a.m. on September 14th, 1990? Well, we talked about it in front of Kenny Workman. Describe Kenny Workman for me physically and, and where he lives. Kenny's about 5'10", slender, kind of long blonde hair, shaved on the sides, and he looks kind of scraggly and lives in an apartment near Shaker Square. I've only seen it once. Uh, he's white, 16 years old, lives with his mother, his sister, and his mother's boyfriend, I think. Do you know his address or, or phone number? No, he, he's better friends with my sister. He, he used to come over a lot when my sister was home, but she went off to college, and this is the first time I've seen him since then. He just came over to see me and my parents. Did, did he have any conversation with or... Did he make any comments about Lisa Pruitt? No, he didn't. We, we were just sitting on some patio furniture for about two minutes, not really saying anything to one another. Uh, we did say something about we wanted to shave Lisa's hair. She, she, she likes her long hair, so I was teasing her. Then I walked Lisa to the car. How do you know that Ken Workman was aware Lisa was coming over? Well, Lisa mentioned it in, Ken, in front of Ken. To your knowledge, prior to yesterday, did Ken Workman know Lisa Pruitt or any type of, or have any type of relationship with her? He just knew her through me and he would have seen her at school. Do you, Ken Workman, and did Lisa Pruitt all attend Shaker Heights High School? Yeah, we do. Dan, how tall are you and, and how much do you weigh? I'm 5'8", about 130 pounds. Is there anything else that you wish to add to this statement? No. Many conventional deodorants contain aluminum, which forms a plug in your sweat glands to keep you from sweating. But Native's deodorant is made without aluminum so you can feel better about what you're putting on your body while smelling and feeling fresh all day long. Native deodorants is formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc, and made with ingredients you actually have heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. It comes in over 10 cents, like coconut and vanilla and lavender and rose. My favorite is coconut and vanilla. Native is also excited for the relaunch of their toothpaste. Native's toothpastes use a special blend of naturally derived cleansers, flavors, and whiteners to deliver a great brushing experience and the same clean mouth feeling you're used to. They offer two minty flavors with the option of fluoride or fluoride-free that will help keep your mouth squeaky clean. There's no risk to try because Native offers free shipping on every order and 30-day free returns and exchanges in the USA. If you haven't tried Native deodorants, you need to. Other deodorants give me rashes. They have me break out a bunch of stuff that, you know, stops the smelling, but the bad side effects are I don't appreciate. That doesn't happen with Native. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com. And use promo code GARAGE during checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com. And use our promo code GARAGE for 20% off your first purchase. Check out nativedeodorant.com today. Designed with measurements from millions of women, Third Love's bra styles are made to fit your life. They have over 80 bra sizes. But know that the only one that matters is yours. If you haven't checked out Third Love yet, you have to. Because these are bras that are designed for your comfort made for style that you can feel great in and it's premium quality and as said they have over 80 bra sizes created with measurements from millions of women yeah you don't have to take our word for it all of our listeners that have tried third love they've been telling us they love third love best quality bra and most comfortable bra that they have owned this is hands down the most comfortable bra that you're going to own with straps that won't slip tagless labels and lightweight Memory foam cups mold to your shape. Plus, returns and exchanges are free and easy, 
In fact, thanks to Third Love's perfect fit promise, every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, return it, and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. That's a great company standing behind their product. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash garage now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash garage for 15% off today. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. ZipRecruiter. Codable co-founder Gretchen Hebner experienced how challenging hiring can be after unsuccessfully searching for a new game artist to grow her education tech company. But then she switched to ZipRecruiter and saw an immediate difference. And you can too by signing up for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. And by using ZipRecruiter screening questions to filter candidates, Gretchen found it easier to focus on the best ones than find the right one. In fact, after posting her job on ZipRecruiter, Gretchen said she was honestly surprised she found qualified applicants so quickly and hired a new game artist in less than two weeks. It's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash garage. Z-I-P-R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R dot com slash garage. Check out ZipRecruiter today. The next interview the Shaker Heights detectives conducted was with Dan Dreyford's father, Robert. The interview began at 10.14 a.m., the morning after the murder. You will hear a break in the narrative about a minute in since page two of this interview has been lost to time. Daniel had been in treatment at the inpatient unit at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation since August 10th, 1990. He was discharged to my care at approximately 2 p.m., September 13th, 1990. At that time, I took him and his possessions to our home, arriving there at approximately 2.30 p.m. After Dan took his belongings to his room, he left to visit Shaker Heights High School at approximately 3 p.m. At that time, I stayed home, had lunch, and rested. He was expected home sometime between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., the purpose of his visit to the high school was to get a schedule, walk through his classes, meet teachers, perhaps get his locker. At approximately 5 p.m., my wife arrived home from work, and shortly thereafter, Dan came home. He told us that he'd not been able to get his schedule, but that he had met at least one of his teachers and talked with them. And also, he had a chance to meet several of his friends at the high school. We had dinner, Dan, my wife, and I, at approximately 6 p.m. after dinner, Dan helped me load some logs in the back of my van, logs which were the result of a tree that was knocked down in last Thursday's storm. My wife and I left the house at approximately 7 p.m. to deliver the logs to a friend of mine in Cleveland Heights and to stop at several stores to pick up some things we needed. The places we stopped at were my friend's house on Cummings Road in Cleveland Heights, followed by Peacock Hardware at Severn Center, where I purchased an electrical socket, followed by Heights Pet World at Mayfield in Warrensville, where I purchased 50 pounds of dog food and a bird feed cup, for which I used my credit card, ending up at Bernie Shulman at Cedar Center, where we spent $41.07 on selected items paid for by check. We left Bernie Shulman's and proceeded home, arriving there at approximately 9 p.m. When we pulled into our driveway, we were greeted at the backyard gate by Dan and a friend of his by the name of Ken. I believe his name is Workman. Dan indicated that Ken had heard that Dan was home and wanted to visit. 
Since this was a long distance call charged to my phone, the start and end time of the call would be accurately recorded by the phone company, which is AT&T. During that conversation, my wife and I first spoke with Deborah, with my wife speaking on the phone in the adjacent den and me on the bedroom phone. During the entire conversation, I was sitting on the bed and Dan was at the foot of the bed listening to the conversation. At some point, I asked Deborah if she would like to speak to Dan, to which she responded affirmatively. At that time, Dan moved to the den adjacent to my bedroom and my wife and I remained in the bedroom. Dan then spoke to my daughter alone until the end of that conversation, which was approximately 12.15 a.m. At that time, Daniel went to his room and I began to read a book in my bed. My wife was at first reading and later turned over and went to sleep. At approximately 12.30 a.m., I heard a shrill and lengthy scream coming from the area in front of our house. The head of my bed is against the Lee Road side of the house, and there's a window adjacent. The window was closed, although the storm window was up. Although we're used to unusual sounds and activities emanating from Lee Road at all times of the day and night, this scream was particularly distressing and alarming. I immediately called out to Daniel, who was in his bedroom. This was relatively easy due to the fact that we had a connecting bathroom between our two rooms, and the door on my side of the bathroom was open. I said something to the effect of, Dan, did you hear that? To which he responded, yes. I then heard him move to his window, facing Lee Road, and heard the window being opened. I myself immediately turned off the table lamp on my bedside table and lifted the panel on the Venetian blind and looked out to Lee Road. I saw nothing unusual as I looked out. I can't recall whether there was any vehicular traffic at the time, but things did seem quite quiet. While I was looking out the window, Dan came into my bedroom. My first inclination was to run outside and see what happened. Realizing I was stark naked, I quickly looked at Dan to determine if he was more fully clothed than I, seeing that he had on essentially the same clothes on that he had been wearing the last time I saw him. I particularly noted and even questioned him about whether he had anything on his feet. I then noticed he was wearing a pair of brown moccasins. This was important to me because I knew he could get out quicker than me. Dan ran downstairs to the front door, while I quickly put on a pair of blue jogging pants and a t-shirt and a pair of sandals, uh, slip-on sandals. I quickly ran downstairs after Dan. By the time I was on the first floor of the house, Dan had opened the front door and storm door, which we kept locked and bolted, and was proceeding down the steps and across the lawn toward Lee Road. I myself only went as far as our front steps. At that time, I asked Dan if he saw anything. He was looking in all directions, but primarily towards South Woodland, which is in fact the direction that I thought the sounds were coming from. Dan told me he saw nothing unusual. I don't know his exact words, but they indicated that there was no unusual activity at the time. Nothing looked out of place to me either. Again, the general traffic pattern seemed quiet as well. At that time... Dan and I returned to the house. Neither one of us left the bounds of our property. We locked the doors and returned to the upstairs bedroom. My wife remained in bed. We told her what we'd seen, or not seen. There was a brief discussion about perhaps calling the police. I don't remember what my wife and son said, but I remember saying or thinking that we'd seen nothing unusual and that it probably wasn't necessary. What was going through my mind at that time was that the screams may have been coming from a passing car, and that the person in distress had probably left the area. I then went back to bed and began to read my book. My wife turned over and went back to sleep. I fell asleep after reading less than a page of the book, and was woken by my son. At that time, he was telling me something about Lisa and a bicycle and the police. 
I wasn't understanding him well, because I was just coming out of a fairly sound sleep, but I quickly grasped that something further was going on related to the scream I had heard earlier. I still had on the clothes I'd put on to go and investigate the scream, so I immediately went downstairs with Dan to see what was happening. Dan and I walked out to the front of the property, down the driveway, at which point I noticed two police cars parked next to the curb. There was no policeman in sight. Dan was telling me something about finding Lisa's bicycle and calling the police. I couldn't understand why Lisa's bicycle would be near our house. I gradually found out by questioning Dan that Lisa and he had communicated some time that evening and that Lisa had indicated to him that she wanted desperately to see him because she had not seen him much during the past month that he'd been in the hospital. They had apparently discussed the possibility that Lisa would come to our house that evening. I asked Dan, how would he know that Lisa was coming? And he mentioned something about her planning to throw a pebble at his window. Dan was at that point obviously upset and stressed by what he had seen. He told me that he had found Lisa's bicycle in the bushes of the house just to the south of ours. That information, coupled with the scream I had heard earlier, increased my own anxiety greatly. I began to worry more about what might have happened at 12.30 a.m. I don't know the exact time that all of this occurred, but it would be some time after the policeman had arrived and spoken with my son. At that point, Dan and I returned to our house Dan sat and watched television on the first floor while my wife and I tried to reconstruct what had happened and to see if there was anything we could do to help. The officers at the scene were quite preoccupied with their work, therefore there was not much that we could do, so we tried to keep out of their way. At one point, my wife and I saw what appeared to be civilians on our tree lawn in embrace. We immediately went out to see if there was anything we could do to help and immediately encountered the parents of Lisa Perret. At that time, we asked them if they knew what was happening. Mr. Perret said, It looked as if there was a dead girl in the bushes. He attempted to move in the direction of the bushes in question and was restrained by an officer. My wife and I offered to have the Perrettes come into our home until the police needed them. They refused our offer. Having nothing else to do, we went back into our house. We came out one more time and spoke to a uniformed officer, asking if we could help or if he knew what had happened. At that point, he said they were dealing with foul play, and we began to suspect the worst. We went back into the house and stayed there until the plainclothes police rang our bell, at which point we escorted them to our dining room table and provided a statement, which included some of the above. By this time, Daniel had gone to his bedroom, turned out the light, and was asleep. Sometime prior to the arrival of the plainclothes men, our neighbor across the street, Mrs. Hall, telephoned and spoke primarily to my wife in an attempt to find out if we knew what had happened. In the course of that conversation, Mrs. Hall used the word murder. During part of that conversation, I listened in on our extension. My wife mentioned something to Mrs. Hall about Dan's girlfriend and her bicycle, but stated that we knew nothing about a murder. This was, in fact, before the officer had used the term foul play to us. Mrs. Hall was obviously prying for information, and my wife tried to cut her off without discussing the matter further until more facts were known. Mrs. Hall is something of a gossip, and we didn't want to feed information to her. This is Detective Richard Mullaney with Shaker Heights Police Department interviewing one Robert C. Dreifert. Would you give me your son's full name, please? Daniel Robert Dreifert. 
Is your son a student, and if so, where? Yes, at Shaker Heights High School. To your knowledge, how long has your son known Lisa Pruitt? They've been classmates for at least a year. As far as I know, they've also been members of the marching band for as long as two years. And I'm not sure if they knew each other in junior high school. I'm only recently aware of her becoming a special friend. Among the many friends that Dan has. And I have heard him refer to her as his girlfriend a few times over the past six months. She's been a guest in our home on a couple occasions, and I'm sure they've met socially through mutual friends and acquaintances and share interests. Could you tell me who Ken Workman is, where he lives, and his phone number if you have it? Ken Workman is a friend of my daughter and my son. He lives in an apartment on North Moreland. I may have his address and phone number at home, but I don't know it offhand. Was there any friction between yourself and your son over his relationship with Lisa Pruitt? Absolutely not. In fact, my wife and I had gone out of our way to invite Lisa to spend the entire afternoon with us when Dan was visiting home last Sunday, September 9th, 1990. Unfortunately, I never got to know Lisa very well, only having met her a couple of occasions but she seemed like a nice girl, and one that I approved of Dan spending his time with. Were you aware that Lisa Pruitt was to visit your son between 12.30 a.m. and 1 a.m. on the morning of September 14, 1990? No. The first time I had an inkling of that was when Dan awoke me and announced that he had found the bicycle and the police were outside. Were you aware at any time prior to the above incident that Lisa Pruitt may have visited your son under similar circumstances? No, I had no inkling that may have happened. When you and your wife were in your bedroom, just prior to hearing the scream, you stated that your bedroom and your son's be bedroom have a bathroom in between and that the door leading from the bathroom to your bedroom was open. Was the door leading from the bathroom to your son's bedroom open? No. So that I understand you correctly, from where you're lying in your bed, you could not visually see your son in his room. Is that correct? I could not see him. When you first heard the scream outside and you and your son went to investigate, did your son come into your room prior to going downstairs and outside? Yes. When Dan went outside to investigate the first time, did you follow him outside? Yes. How far did you go outside the house the first time? I went to the front steps. Could you repeat for me how your son was dressed at that time? As near as I can recall, he had on a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and some brown moccasins. Was that a white t-shirt? I think it was white with some writing on it. My recollection is that it was the one we later found on the bookcase next to the clothes chute. Showing you a white t-shirt, brand name Fruit of the Loom. Size large, 42 to 44, with writing on the front in purple and black ink, containing the words Spring Conference 1988, Toledo, Maumee Valley, and also containing the words, The Search for Self, and the letters, Why are you you? Is this the shirt that Dan was wearing? That could very well have been it. If not, it is one very similar to it. At the time, I was more interested in getting dressed myself and getting downstairs. The clothing that I was most focused on with Dan was the shoes. Because as I said... I was concerned that one of us have shoes on so one of us could get outside quickly. Dan has mainly t-shirts, and if I were to have to swear to it, I could not swear that was the one. But it was one like it. From the time you came home from the store at approximately 9 p.m. on the evening of September 13th, 1990, until you saw your son wearing the brown moccasins, did you observe him wearing any other shoes on that evening? 
I have to say that I wasn't aware of what he was wearing on his feet until I asked him if he had something on his feet and we were preparing to go downstairs. Prior to that, I hadn't noticed what he was wearing. You have to remember that I was separate from him most of that period. He was downstairs and I was upstairs. To your knowledge, does your son Dan own a pair of Converse high top tennis shoes? which are multicolored or tie-dyed. He has shoes like that, yeah. You stated that when you and Dan went downstairs and outside the first time to investigate the scream. Was the front door locked? Because I was concentrating on getting dressed as fast as I could and rushing down the stairs. And Dan was already dressed and going down ahead of me. I only know that Dan got out ahead of me. I don't have a specific memory of whether I saw Dan unlocking the door. In any case, and it does not take long to open our door. When you first heard the scream and you're going outside, did you have any thoughts as to what might have happened? When I heard the scream, number one, I immediately associated it with female voice in my mind. Number two, it was intense and somewhat prolonged. It may have passed through my mind that that's another one of those rowdy kids or people in cars that we sometimes encounter on Lee Road. But there was enough urgency in the scream that it did make me want to run down and see what happened. Thinking what might have happened, it always occurs when you hear something like that is that somebody might be being attacked. But then, we've heard noises like that on Lee Road where people clowning around or playing pranks. Again, there was enough urgency in this scream for me to want to see what was happening. Aside from that, I guess a lot of things raced through your mind at a time like that. Why you were going outside, did you at any time call your son to tell him not to go out before you went out? Or did you feel any apprehension about him going out there alone? I don't remember saying those specific words, or words to that effect, and any apprehension I may have had was lessened by the fact that I myself was hot on his heels. Therefore, I think I would not have had any apprehension any more than for myself, and I probably would have felt better with both of us out there than either one of us alone. When you heard the scream, did... Did it seem to come from one location, or did the sound of the scream seem to move at all? All I can recall is that it seemed to come generally from the front of the house, and perhaps towards the south end of the property, but I can't be absolutely certain because it did happen kind of fast. I can remember looking out the window, trying to pinpoint the location, expecting to see cars or people. And when I didn't see that, my next reaction was to quickly get down and find out what was happening. I can't say if it was moving or not. In your opinion, did the scream seem to come from a male or female? And if you can't approximate age as young or old? I've already said that it sounded like a female. And I'm not sure how to equate pitch with age. So I can't answer the second part of that question. All I can say is that it was rather high-pitched, which probably makes me think female. Could you tell me if the scream was a continuous scream, or were there breaks in the screaming? It was fairly continuous. There may have been one or more brief, very instantaneous breaks, but the overall impact of it was a prolonged, more continuous from the time you went back in the house after talking to the Pruitts until myself and Sergeant Reed rang your doorbell, how much time passed approximately? I find that very difficult to answer because at the time I was not looking at any clocks and my wife and I were trying to determine what it was we should be doing to help and responding to that neighbor's telephone call and as I may have forgotten to mention... We made one or two calls to the Cleveland Clinic nurse who had dealt with Dan in the hospital. So in the midst of all that, I was not aware of the passage of time. How many windows are in your bedroom? Two that face Lee Road and four others. 
Two Face Lee Road, Two Face South Woodland, and two others face the back of the house. When you heard the screams, which window did you look out? The one that faces Lee Road, which is the north of the two that face Lee Road, which is on my side of the bed. Did you look out any other windows when you heard the scream? No, we have Venetian blinds. First thing I did was turn off the light, then Dan was right there. Is there anything else that you wish to add to the statement? I can't think of anything right now. The following day. This is Saturday, September 15th, 1990. The police interviewed Dan Dryford's mother, Jean, at 10.38 a.m. I was at work until almost 5 o'clock p.m. So when I got home at around 5 o'clock p.m., Dan was not home. His father said he had gone up to the school. So I didn't see him until he arrived home, I'd say, about 5.30 p.m. We ate dinner around 6 p.m. Then my husband and I went out shopping, and I think it was close to 7 p.m. When we came back at about 9 p.m., maybe before 9 p.m., Dan was there with Ken. It was shortly before 9 p.m. We were in the process of unloading the car, Dan and Ken helping us carry the bags in, when Lisa walked in the open door, which we had propped open. It was about 9 p.m., I spoke to her and asked if her father wanted to come in, and she said he was listening to something on the radio and would be happy to stay out in the driveway, that she could only stay for five minutes. Dan took her out to the back patio. I went and closed the car down, shut the doors, did a few things, and realized that more than five minutes had gone by. So I shouted out the back door and told them that her father was waiting. I saw them go towards the driveway. A few minutes later, I looked out the driveway door and heard that they were still there and again said something to them because I did not like it that her father was sitting there all that time. After that, the phone rang many times for Daniel. I answered most of the calls and called Daniel to the phone. He was sitting out on the patio with Ken Workman. Before we left to go shopping, Daniel asked if it was all right if he cut his hair. He wanted to spread some papers out in front of the hall mirror And we said, sure. And he also found the clipper set we have and was using those as best he could. When we came back home, he showed us how Kim Rathbone, our neighbor to the rear, had showed him how to do a better job on his haircut. He had obtained prior permission so that she could come over while we were out of the house. One of the phone calls I took for Dan, I recognized Lisa's voice, but neither one of us acknowledged who we were. Somewhere in there, my husband went to bed, and Daniel and I talked for a long while about the hospital experience and who he had seen up at the high school that afternoon. I also washed dishes. While I was washing dishes, Daniel said he wanted to watch the news at 11 p.m., which he did. Bob called down at that time and asked what we were doing, and I said, I'm washing dishes and Dan is watching the news. At about 11.15 p.m., I went upstairs, and at about 11.31 p.m., I called down and said, Dan, the news is over and he apparently shut the TV off and had come upstairs. After that, he came into our bedroom several times. Once I remember, he went into our bathroom. I just don't remember what he said or asked the other two times, but I would say it was at least three times that he popped in there. At about midnight, the phone rang, and we don't believe in answering the phone that late, but we heard on the answering machine that it was our daughter. Bob stayed on the bedroom phone, and I went into the adjoining office and talked on that phone. We spoke for about 10 or 15 minutes, and Dan came into the office and took the extension in the office, and I went back in the bedroom and closed the door, and he spoke for an additional five minutes. I went to bed. I can't remember if I read, but I usually do, turned off the light, and started to go to sleep. I heard my husband shout something like, what was that? And I could hear in my mind the echo of a long scream. I put it that way because I was mostly asleep, but I heard a long scream. Through all the rest of this, I remained in the bed with my eyes closed. Bob sprang up, turned off his light, making the room dark so you can look out better. As he looked out, or just after that, Dan came into the room, remarking that the room was dark or black. I heard Bob say, you're dressed, go down and see if you can see something, or something like that. And I heard him putting clothes on. Just about the time he left the room. He was right behind Dan, I think. I heard a vehicle pull away from about in front of our house. It was like two sounds, like changing gears with a pause. I was very aware of it because we had just heard the scream. It's the kind of thing I listen for when I hear something out of the ordinary. I heard no other traffic. The next thing I remember is Bob coming back in the room, and I think he asked me if I should call the police. And I said something like, we're always calling them. Let someone else call them. 
Oh, I said, they're long gone. What's the use? What's the point? I fell asleep again. The next thing I know is Dan is waking us up and I had a real hard time waking up so that I only heard little pieces like the police are here, Lisa's bicycle. And I'm lying in bed with my eyes closed. Didn't want to wake up. Bob went downstairs. Somewhere in there, I realized that all this wasn't going to go away. So I got up and threw on some clothes and went downstairs. The rest is really muddled. From this point on, I just remember snatches like snapshots. Sometimes we were downstairs. Sometimes we were upstairs. At one point when we were upstairs, I saw a couple embraced on the sidewalk and I said, Bob, that must be Lisa's parents. And so Dan at that point had already gone to his room and closed the door. So I had spoken to him before that. I don't remember what. So we went down and talked to her parents. At that point, we were under the impression that she had been abducted and we offered that they should come in or is there anything that we can do? And Mr. Pruitt got excited at some policeman and I thought we should go back in. I got the feeling they might not be aware that we were there. Another time, I remember seeing the neighbor across the street in her nightgown. I looked out the window occasionally, and I remember I kept thinking, why are they still here? We have wooden slat blinds, so there's no way to look out without physically getting up and lifting the slats. I didn't think that this is where they should be, that they should be out looking for her. At another point in time, I remember saying to Bob, they've got flashlights, they're looking around. Another point, we again went downstairs and outside to again ask if there was anything we could do. We felt prior to that, we wanted to leave the police alone to let them do what they had to do. They told us someone would be in in, in a few minutes to take our statements. So we went back inside and eventually someone did come. Shortly after I saw Mrs. Hall in her nightgown in front of her house, she called on the telephone. I'm not surprised. She asked what was happening, who had been killed. And I said to her, what do you mean killed? Did the police tell you that? And she said something like, no, but there is a body or they found a body or something like that. I know she's the neighborhood gossip and I'm very careful with my, she might've been leaping to conclusions. I told her we didn't know anything. We didn't know about any body. Another thing she said was that the police wouldn't tell her if the person was black or white, male or female. I told her that a girlfriend was going to visit Dan in response to that statement. And I told her to please not say anything to anybody. I told her that much because she had gone on at great length about hearing someone breaking branches and her dog barking and seemed quite upset. She had heard the screams also. Another reason I was hesitant about calling the police was a couple of times Bob had gone to help people who seemed to be in distress and it was a joke and they laughed at him and took off or swore at him. So I always tried to prevent him from putting himself out like that. When you arrived home after shopping, as you stated, shortly before 9 p.m., do you recall what your son Dan was wearing at that time? One of his t-shirts and a pair of shorts. All his shorts are colorful and all his t-shirts are white with something on the front of them. So that's it. Would you say the shorts were light or dark in color? I don't remember. Do you recall what type of shoes he was wearing? Somewhere between the time of 5.30 p.m. and the time I went to bed, he and I had a conversation about the shoes he was wearing, which were tennis shoes. I can't pin it down any closer than that, except I know they weren't the holy ones. At that point, after we got home from shopping, I don't know if I noticed his shoes. Could you describe Kim Rathbone, where she lives, and her relationship with Dan and your family? The Rathbone property adjoins ours at the rear line for about 50 feet. She is a classmate of Dan's at the high school, is also in the band. They have many fence talks. Last year, she was his wake-up service in that she called every morning at 7 a.m. so they would have to come to the phone and would help wake him up. She is going with one of his longtime very good friends, who is Brian Keating. To your knowledge, does or did Kim Rathbone have any type of romantic relationship with your son? Definitely not. They're just friends. In the body of your statement, you state that sometime after 9 p.m., after Lisa Pruitt and her father had left, that female, whose voice you recognize as Lisa Pruitt, called on the telephone for Dan. Do you know at approximately what time that was? It's hard to tell. He got back-to-back phone calls. It's my impression, because I remember thinking she was just here, that it was about 9.30 or 9.45 p.m., but I'm not sure. After Dan talked to Lisa during this phone call, did he relate to you any content of the conversation? No, I don't think I was even in the room. I don't usually ask him about his phone calls. Are you aware of anyone else who had dated or had a romantic 
type relationship with Lisa Pruitt? No. Do you recall what time that Ken Workman left your home on the evening of September 13th, 1990? He was gone by 10.05 p.m. for sure because I looked out on the patio. I told Dan he had to be gone by 10 p.m. Did you see Ken Workman at any time later than that, that evening? No. On the night of September 13th, 1990, did you see Chris Jones or any other or any other of your son's friends at your residence? I don't think so. I don't remember. The scream that you stated you heard when you're lying in bed, could you tell me approximately what time that was? At some point while I was lying there, from the time of the scream to the time Bob got back to the room, I looked at the clock and it said 12.32 a.m. After you heard the scream, did your son, Dan, come into your room at any time? Yes. Could you approximate the time between your hearing the scream and when you saw your son? I heard him come into the room and speak within a minute, 45 seconds to a minute after the scream. Could you describe, as best as you can, if the scream you heard was from a male or female, young or old? My impression was that it was a female, not child, not elderly. Would you say that the scream was from someone in distress? Yes. Was the scream you heard a continuous one, or was it a series of shorter screams? Continuous. Could you estimate the time from when you heard the scream until you heard what you stated was a, was a vehicle pulling off from the area in front of your house? Dan and Bob were going down the stairs, so it had to be roughly around one minute after. From the sound of the vehicle, could you determine the direction it was traveling? Definitely south, towards South Woodland. You stated that you heard two separate sounds, as if this vehicle was changing gears. Is that correct? Yes, I did state that. It was like vroom, vroom. It was a heavy sound. I remember thinking... What the hell was that? I hear a lot of traffic, so I know a bus, a motorcycle, a sedan, and it was definitely not one of those unless the muffler was modified in some way. Could it have been a truck? Yes. After you have woken and you are aware that the police were on the scene and that something had obviously occurred, what conversation did you have with your son concerning this incident. We spoke very little. I could tell he was upset. I asked him some questions, which he answered pretty much in monosyllables. I cannot specifically remember what I asked him at the time, as opposed to some later time. Just enough to understand that without our knowing it, that he had arranged with Lisa for her to come over. I remember now that he said she had said she would probably come over and would throw gravel or something at his window. Did Dan mention to you that he had found the bike in the bushes and that it was Lisa Pruitt's bike? I'm not sure. I had already heard some of that, and how I found out those details, I don't know when. As I woke up, there was Lisa Pruitt and Bike, and so when I heard it, I don't really remember. Do you recall Dan telling you that he believed Lisa Pruitt had been abducted? He never said that. That was in my mind. Is there anything else that you wish to add to the statement? No. It is now 36 hours after the murder of Lisa Pruitt. Police have completed their interviews with the Dreyford family. How much of their story do the detectives believe at this time? It's hard to say. Opinion has no real place in a serious investigation. You are supposed to follow the evidence. You listen to the witnesses. You attempt to see if their statements match up with the facts you know. As of Saturday afternoon, though their pool of suspects is quite small, isn't it? But everything is about to change. At 4.50 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, a good friend of Dan Dryford's goes to the police station with a story that will alter the course of this investigation forever. He believes he knows who killed Lisa Pruitt. I know Dan from Band. I've known him since about 8th grade. We've been friends since then, until now. I've known Lisa since I was in 10th grade, 
and I've known Kevin since I was in ninth grade. Dan and Lisa have been going out for a couple months now. Kevin supposedly has liked Lisa for a long time now. Most girls blow Kevin off, because he seems kind of weird. We were at Arabica at Shaker Square, me and Shane McGee. We were standing by Shane's car talking with Kevin, and we were talking about Dan Dryford. And Kevin Young said something like, I'd hate to be Dan because he doesn't get any play. And me and Shane McGee both laughed. Kevin was like, why are you guys laughing? And we were both like, because Dan gets a lot of play from girls. And Kevin Young said, well, he's not getting any from Lisa Pruitt. And I said, yes he is. He's sleeping with her. And Kevin just freaked. He was like, that asshole. That asshole, I hate him. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> 